Okay, um, I think we should start, um, and I would like you to uh, welcome this evening our speaker, Marcus Novak. Uh, and I would also like you, for those of you uh, who are students at the AA, to sort of take note of the fact uh, that this is event is sort of co-sponsored uh, by the London Consortium. Um, and at the moment, we're in the sort of business of trying to reconfigure our relationship with the graduate school uh, the London Consortium um, and one of their kind of undertakings. sponsor events um, perhaps we would find it difficult to cover uh, the whole sequence or series of them by ourselves um, so I'd like to sort of make it very plain um, that this is hosted not only by the AA but also Okay, as I say, we're welcoming this evening um, Marcus Novak, uh, who has actually kind of been to give a brief uh, seminar in the graduate school in the last academic year, uh, but who is here now to give a full evening lecture. And judging by the kind of size uh, of the audience, For those who don't, uh, kind of an artist, a theorist, uh, and what he describes as a sort of trans architect. I mean, uh, you notice like everyone's always trying to re is now an infra architect or a trans architect or a sort of it, it, it's as if somehow it's not enough to be an architect, and perhaps that points to the very condition that he wants to speak about. Um, for those of you who know his work, his, his writings uh, are extremely kind of widely disseminated. There's there are quite a lot of spaces here in the North Jury Room. There are one or two in the front row uh, here. And his own work draws upon the relationship or the sort of correspondences between architecture, uh, music, especially where issues within those two cross the field of computation. Um, as such, obviously, the work doesn't fall easily or simply uh, into discipline, but I'm sure the reason why you're here uh, is because that's a situation uh, which you're welcome. Um, he was known as a sort of pioneer uh, of the very concept of cyberspace, um, and, you know, more narrowly, um, of the use of generative computational composition in architecture and design. And recently, last year, in fact, in recognition to his, for his contribution uh, to the arts and architecture, he was elected a fellow of the World Technology Network. Currently, he's kind of based, though obviously uh, tends to be fairly nomadic. Uh, he's based at the University of California particular at the site of the University of Santa Barbara, where he's affiliated to the California Nanosystems Institute and the Media Art and Technology and the Art Studio. So I'd like very much to welcome you.
Thank you all for coming, and uh, I'm, I'm very, very happy to be here. Every time I come here, I enjoy the energy that this place has, which is really quite uh, unmatched anywhere. Uh, so it's very, very good to, to be here. Um, I'm going to uh, talk to you tonight about all sorts of things, uh, a kind of journey, I suppose, um, trying to uh, cover some ground and try trying to frame and, and give some context to what perhaps you might know of what I've been doing and then to bring it to what I am doing and what uh, uh, my PhD students and I are working on and some new directions that I think are, are pertinent to um, what we are doing and what, what architecture or trans architecture as you, as you wish uh, might be doing. And uh, hopefully it'll, it'll touch upon enough things that will be relevant to all of you in some ways. Uh, if, I, if I touch upon enough, I'm sure to hit something. Uh, so where I'd like to begin is uh, with, uh, with a journey that I took just uh, very recently to Mexico to go to a place called Gilitla, uh, a town called Gilitla, to see the work of uh, a fabulous uh, British eccentric called Edward James. And to get to Kilitla, you have to go over the mountains. And this is, these are some of the mountains that you have to go through if you go from Mexico City, anyway. And uh, when you when you go over these mountains, um, you wind up in the jungle, uh, and it's uh, it's a little bit like this. And in the jungle, uh, this person Edward James uh, spent. 30 years building something. And you can begin to see some of what he was building in, in here, but that's not, that, that's not really a good indication. You'll, you'll see a little more of it uh, shortly. Now, Edward James happened to be um, very wealthy. He was the grandson of Edward VII, the king, and the heir to that fortune, plus a couple of others. The rumor is that he was well, the fact was that he was the grandson of the king. The rumor is that he may have also been the son of the king, um, which gets a little bit confusing. But in any case, he benefited from it all uh, in terms of wealth, uh, though not in terms of ease. And so he was never quite comfortable with his predicament. And he became uh, an affiliate and friend and eventually the greatest collector of the surrealists uh, and their work. And uh, himself uh, a surrealist uh, of sorts. Uh, he never quite fit into his society and decided he would go to the jungle and found a beautiful place in Mexico near Gilitla called Las Posas, which means the pools, and um, decided he wanted to grow flowers. And he grew these flowers until something very unlikely happened, uh, which was that it snowed in the jungle this one time, and of course killed all the flowers. And then he decided that, well, he wasn't going to have that. And he started building flowers and many more things out of concrete. And he started building these structures. He bought 80 acres of, of the jungle. And he started building these structures that were quasi-botanical, quasi-surreal, quasi who knows what, with rem remembrances of Gaudi and uh, the Watts Towers in LA, which he actually helped save. Um, and uh, they, they just go on and on. I'll show you a little bit more. It won't show you much of the work. But it was interesting to me to be here. I was actually in Mexico because there was a show there called Rizoma, which is uh, rhizome. You might know rhizomes from Deleuze and Guattari and A Thousand Plateaus and such. And then uh, here, here was the jungle, which was 
perhaps the place of rhizomes. There were vines and, and roots and different kinds of uh, uh, forms of, of life that were rhizomatic. And in this jungle was this series of constructs like this. This is just one among many of these uh, ruins that were all made of concrete and were, were botanical in their inspiration, but also rhizomatic in their execution. They were literally growing out of opportuni opportunities uh, throughout the jungle. Uh, opportunities of view, opportunities of alignment, opp opportunities of, of uh, accidents that then became permanent. Uh, and they were built out of concrete, uh, which of course is in a certain sense a, a rhizomatic material because you can make, well not anything of it, but quite uh, quite close to anything. It, it's, it, in any case, an extremely malleable uh, material that can take uh, quite, a, quite a number of forms. And so um, I thought it was an interesting uh, instance of, of how worlds come into being uh, by being particular in the sense of being made of particles. Um, This is what it actually looks like when, when we're there. We need some sound. This going on and on. Uh, you can spend the whole day looking at these things and you're not done with them and you want to come back. Uh, to see more. Then, in this, of course, there was the presence of water. And in the presence of water, in these pools, there was this very clear water. And uh, I, I found myself looking at it and thinking, how strange. Uh, here's this water. It's liquid, obviously. It's water. Uh, it's running. Fluid, it's it's changing, it's it's malleable, uh, and it's also very very transparent. And in places, it was actually very deep. The, the photograph didn't ca quite capture what had struck me was that, but there were places where the water was, you know, literally felt this thick as it came over the the edge of the waterfall, uh, but never lost any of its clarity, any of its movement, and any of its flow. And I was thinking that you know, if you really think about what water is, if you get down to its molecular level, it's not liquid at all. It's actually very dry. Now, how curious. You have this, this condition that we recognize as being completely liquid, and yet the fact of it is that it's not like that at all. Actually, the fact that we think it's liquid is an after effect. It's actually the result of it being made of a, mater of a material that is particular. It's made of all these particles. but but also, it's translucent to us because what's there is so much less than what's not there. Meaning that the only reason I can see through all this mass that's moving, I mean, all these, all, all this, all these molecules that are flying by, is that the space between what's actually there at, at, at an atomic and subatomic particle and what isn't, the kind of void versus the solid, the actual solidity, is so much bigger. The space is so much bigger than, the, than what is present. That, that finally we can see right through it if certain conditions prevail. Uh, and we could get into the nature of water, but, but we don't want to do that. Rather, uh, what I'm trying to, to bring to the conversation uh, is a sense of the atomic. And uh, obviously, one of the things that you might know about the, the work I've been doing for a long time now is something about liquid architecture which uh, I'll try to unpack in, in a variety of ways shortly. Um, but uh, to, to indicate that that discourse, which continues to grow after all this time, it, it keeps on rolling and evolving into different things, has moved into uh, a kind of new chapter that deals with the very small and the atomic, and then something that I'll try to describe to you as the, uh, the alloatomic. Um, You'll hear me refer to the prefix alos uh, repeatedly. Uh, the prefix alos being, being the root of the word alien and the word else and the word alternative 
and meaning a deep sense of the other, you know, the, the, a kind of, not, not just the, the ordinary other, which is anything other than I, but a kind of distance, distant sense of that. So uh, something about the world being made of the very small, but then the very small being subject to our definition and to our reconfiguration and rearticulation uh, as, uh, as uh, other kinds of things. Now, uh, there are some other strands that, that will be woven through here, uh, many of them, but let me just introduce some of them. Um, there was a study that was just reported in the news, uh, what, uh, probably just last week, uh, and it had to do with what I would reclassify as uh, something, something about the objective sense of beauty, or the objectivity of beauty, or how when we say that something is attractive or beautiful, or w when we make an aesthetic judgment, it's not quite as subjective as we've been led to believe, and we may actually be operating as instruments in the sense of measuring something. Uh, this was a study that uh, uh, looked at uh, 59 uh, women from age uh, 18 to 25, and then had a group of people uh, evaluating uh, the appearance of these women, uh, the, 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 the people being men and women also of the same age group, 18 to 25, and uh, judging these women, or ranking these women, not judging in terms of any kind of good or bad or anything of the sort, but, but evaluating uh, attractiveness, femininity, and health, and uh, finding a correlation between something objective, which I'll describe in a moment. Uh, the, um, first of all, you know, look at these, these images before I say much more and say to yourself which one you find more attractive. Okay, just mark left or right in your mind. Um, right? Easy. Uh, now, here's, here's, here's what was done. Um, uh, the 59 were, were, were sort of presented, people checked which one they thought. All of this was calibrated. They found a very strong correlation with a certain fact. Um, they measured the fact. I won't say what for a moment. They measured the fact. They took the 10 women who were at the top of the scale, and then they took the 10 at the other side of the scale. Again, I don't want to say top and bottom in any kind of evaluative way or, or judgmental way, just the, the, the higher measure and the lower measure. Uh, and uh, and I should say also, by the way, you know, this happened to be a study with women. It could have been a study with men. It would have been a slightly different measure. Right? It's, it's nothing sexist or anything. It's just, you know, it just happens that, that women chose women to study. I mean, the, the researchers were women too. Um, that helps. Um, so, so what happened then was that they took the 10 at the top and the 10 at the other, at the bottom, but it's not the bottom, right? Because uh, we don't want to judge anybody. Um, and uh, they averaged the faces. And so what you're seeing are not two real people. You're seeing the 10 average faces on, on the one end of the scale and the 10 averaged faces at the other end of the scale. Now, I'm willing to bet that most of you, maybe not all of you, and actually it depends, you know, I've, I've, I ran it through my, my own students and the only one who, the, the only exception was, was a person from another culture. Uh, so it might be, there might be a cultural bias. Obviously, this is a particular culture. Uh, but uh, everyone else that I've asked has, has reported that uh, the left face is more attractive, feminine, and healthy than the right, at least in appearance. Okay, we don't know the people, we just find people. Um, so uh, if you thought so, then it might be that what you, what, what you, what you saw was uh, the result of a lifelong process of measurement that, that uh, correlated the presence of estrogen with appearance. Because th the 10 women of these 59 who had higher estrogen, and they were measured at the time of their ovulation, and you know, like, they were like very, very specifically measured. The, 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 the 10 women who had the highest estrogen produced the face on the left. The 10 who had the lowest produced the face on the right. Now, uh, th and there are various understandings of what it might have had to do with different ages of development and, and uh, you know, what happened at puberty and, you know, don't do this at home, don't, don't get estrogen injections, 
uh, <laughs> all of that. But it's a curious thing that, that there should be that kind of uh, uh, objective measure that was really highly correlated. And if you send me email, I'll send you back the study. Um, uh, or if you just go to newscientist.com, you'll find it. Uh, it's a curious thing that there should be any kind of objective measure to something that we tell ourselves is not objective. You know, we tell ourselves that it's all relative, it's all a matter of taste. Um, I would argue, and I've, I've argued forever, that when we say something like that, we're actually saying something precise, and it might be that we're in the dark ages about what that is, just as not so many years ago no one would have known what chaos was, but in the meantime, there's been a development of something called chaos theory that, that knows quite a lot about what chaos is and how to generate it and how to detect it and how to evaluate it and how to categorize it and, and on and on and on. So there's something about beauty in, this, in, in these speculations and there's some sense that we might be able to find out more about it and that actually humans are highly invested in, in those measures for whatever reason, that it's not... Uh, it's not an indifferent thing to us. We actually make all sorts of pretty important decisions uh, uh, on it, uh, whether it's uh, all sorts of things. Um, here's another little thing that we do, though. Uh, another pairing of faces. Uh, if, if you follow these kinds of things, as, as I do from, from too often to too often, uh, you find out that we're producing lots and lots of mutants everywhere. Uh, so here's a little turtle with two heads uh, trying to decide which one of them is going to get more estrogen, I suppose. Um, but um, there, there's something in the talk about how it is that we produce new kinds of creatures and, and how, we, how we might be doing it for better or for worse. And I'll return to this, so I won't explain it right now. I'll just, uh, I'll just leave it. You'll see a, another little creature shortly. Um, something is sending a signal to something. Um, then, um, another, another strand of this will have to do with, is this my telephone doing that? Just a second, let's uh, take no chances. Okay, um, you've, you've perhaps all heard of uh, Moore's Law. Uh, since you all have computers, uh, you, you know that they get faster and faster. Uh, every 18 months, they get twice as fast and half as cheap, and half, as, half as expensive, twice as cheap, I suppose I should say, shouldn't I? Um, and it seems to, to be going on, uh, and ha it seems to have been going on for, for a long, long time. Uh, there's this person named Ray Kurzweil who wrote a book called The Age of Spiritual Machines and who now has produced this big tone called The Singularity is Near, the, the sort of the end is near, the apocalyptic tone is intentional uh, and amusing. Uh, but the, um, uh, the subtitle is When Humans Transcend Biology. And uh, there, there's an argument that's built about what's going on with uh, the sort of technological situation we've created. So this, this chart, which is from this book now, uh, shows uh, Moore's law, which started more or less when, when, uh, when transistors came in and proceeded to the present, uh, actually could be taken back in time to electromechanical devices and relays and, and so on. And it forms this kind of exponentially rising curve. Uh, what he does then is he begins to look at other kinds of things. Uh, a curve that rises exponentially in a regular grid will rise linearly in a logarithmic grid. So he goes back to 1870 and now looks at the number of patents that have been granted and shows that they've been rising exponentially as well. They're more or less a straight line um, here, so that's an exponential curve. If you plotted it the other way, you just take more space to, to develop it. And then um, begins to look at other kinds of things, such as uh, the rate of adoption of different kinds of communication technologies and uh, how, they, how it gets faster and faster to pick each one up, and more and more people uh, pick it up. Uh, so you, you get the same kind of exponential curve showing up here. And then takes it farther back, 
and shows that uh, various kinds of uh, milestones that we hold, uh, such as uh, the beginning of life, uh, the first tools, uh, techniques for starting fire, uh, democracy, the Renaissance, the Industrial Revolution, modern physics, nuclear energy, all these things actually have been accelerating as well. And tries to build the argument that uh, knowledge is a feedback system. Uh, such that the more knowledge you have, the more knowledge you can get, the more science you have, the more science you can develop, the more, you know, it, it just keeps on uh, uh, reinforcing itself and consequently creates a kind of exponential growth. This straight line means the same kind of exponentially rising curve as the, as the other one. And then he correlates his own observations with those of various other kinds of groups and people who have uh, <coughs> made lists of paradigm shifts and key events in human history and uh, finds that when you put those on a chart, not just the opinions of one person, but really the aggregate of all of these sources, uh, you get the same kind of uh, figure. So he and others, um, and actually the story goes back to the 50s, uh, maybe even before that, have been speculating about what would happen if intelligence produces a machine that is super intelligent. And it's a, it's a curious kind of thing. Um, uh, here's, here's a, I'll have to read this to you, you probably can't see it. Uh, though often thought to have originated in the, in the last two decades of the 20th century, the idea of a technological singularity, which I'll explain in a moment, actually dates back to the 1950s. Quote, one conversation centered on the ever accelerating progress of technology and changes in the mode of human life which gives the appearance of approaching some essential singularity in the history of the race beyond which human affairs as we know them could not continue. That was the mathematician Stanislaw Ulam in 58 talking about a conversation with John von Neumann who was another mathematician. Uh, most of the computers that we use still are von Neumann machines, meaning they execute one instruction at a time. That's about to become history too. Uh, but this other one, there's another quote from 1965 by a statistician named I.J. Good, uh, who is more in keeping with, with this notion of the singularity. It says, let an ultra-intelligent machine be defined as a machine that can far surpass all the intellectual activities of any man, however clever. Since the design of machines uh, is one of these intellectual activities, an ultra-intelligent machine could design even better machines. There would, then be, there would then unquestionably be an intelligence explosion, and the intelligence of man would be left far behind. Thus, the first ultra-intelligent machine is the last invention that man ever need make, or need ever make. <coughs> now, the, the argument that, that various people, including Kurzweil, have been making, and it's really quite a substantial group of people who are really quite well informed, so it can't be dismissed very easily, is that sometime, at some point in the future, which seems to be as early as 2030 or so, 2030, 2040, when you project these, these kinds of, this kind of information, even conservatively, um, when, when, uh, oh, um, when, uh, when you do that, uh, you, you come to this, this point, uh, which is called a singularity. Now, uh, some of you may know what a black hole is and what an event horizon is. Um, a black hole is, is when, a, when a star collapses to a point and creates a gravitational field uh, that is very, very powerful uh, for an object that is virtually uh, not to be seen, it's so dense. Uh, and it, um, th this, this black hole has uh, a radius within which uh, anything that will, well, let me put it, uh, let me get my English uh, straight here. Uh, uh, if you have such an object, there is a radius uh, beyond which an object could travel and not get captured by the gravitational field, and a horizon, or a kind of surface of, of a radius, uh, which uh, would be so strong from which nothing could possibly escape. So once you get to the event horizon, if you get pulled in, you get pulled in. And, and it, it, can, it creates a condition around itself such that the laws of physics as we know them no longer seem to function. It, it, singularity, therefore, is a kind of exception to the physics as, as we know them and a, a kind of 
black hole not only because you can't see anything, because light, even light gets pulled into this thing, uh, but because you can't quite predict what would happen in there. Now, having said that, physicists are predicting what would happen in there. Um, anyway, the idea is that somehow what's coming up is that kind of a condition, the, uh, a condition uh, uh, in which machines become so powerful and intelligent and so implicated in the human uh, that, uh, that the human and the machine-like uh, become fused into some construct that we can't quite tell uh, the nature of and uh, with impacts upon our institutions and ways of living that we can't quite foretell. But um, the, the corollary of that is that if, if that's at all true, we ought to be looking in that direction. We ought to be uh, careful. Okay, that's, that's one, set of, um, one set of notions and we'll, we'll return to, uh, to other ones. Now let's uh, uh, let's see. Let's go here. Um, now this is more about the strangeness of the things that we're constructing. Uh, this is a little V uh, with an antenna. Um, and it's one of a whole swarm of bees with antennas. And uh, I, I think it has this really wonderful uh, uh, iconic quality to it uh, as an image. I think it's really quite, quite powerful. Uh, scientists decided that they couldn't quite tell what a bee's dance was all about, that the only way to study them was to know what exactly where each bee was. And so they attached these little transmitters and watched them and, and detected various kinds of things. Uh, about about how bees uh, behave. But th the reason I'm showing it is because these kinds of images are proliferating very rapidly and they're, they're part of this notion of the, the singularity. The world that we live in is, is becoming increasingly strange and uh, to not register that is a kind of willfulness and a kind of escapism from, from what's happening. So um, part of what, what uh, I've been building over this time that finally is, uh, is becoming articulate and has focused around this name called transvergence is, is a, a kind of record and anticipation and perhaps the proposition for a stance and a strategy for how to deal with, with this uh, condition. Um, okay, let's, let's, let's put this in a little bit of context now that has to do with uh, uh, some of the things that I've been working on. Uh, to, to bring it back to what, uh, what I'm supposed to do in an architecture school, for sure. Let's just show some pretty pictures. Uh, I was invited in 2000 to participate in the Venice Biennale and uh, represented Greece, which is where I, where I grew up, and eventually they, they figured that out. And uh, they, they invited me to, to, to participate in the Biennale for them. And I created a piece called Invisible uh, Architectures, which had to do with sensors and devices and interactivity and higher dimensional space and, and, and many kinds of things, uh, which I won't show you this time. Uh, but in 2000, uh, there were very few people who were seriously using computers in, in architecture in any kind of uh, way that was literally generative and literally having to do with making something that couldn't be made. made with this technology. There were people who were using them for production and for representation and for rendering, but in terms of actually engaging uh, technology architectonically for the kinds of things that were pertinent to, to the discipline itself, uh, there weren't very many. Uh, through a whole series of accidents, I seem to have been a very early part practitioner of this, and there were perhaps a few others, uh, Mark Wilker, who, who you'll see was, was there Cass, Osterhaus, and Lars Spybrook, uh, um, Hani Rashid, uh, Greg Lynn, and uh, that may have been it. You know, and, and then in the cafe, uh, Cafe Paradiso, uh, uh, you would hear people sort of whispering, shh, you know, there was all that. Uh, you know, people were just beginning to talk about something they were doing with computers, but it was really pretty shy. 
in, in 2004, I was invited back by Kurt, Kurt Forster to participate uh, in the piece of the show called Metamorphosis, uh, which was in the, in the uh, Arsenale, these, uh, these three very long rooms, each 100 meters long, I think. Uh, and uh, uh, th in that portion, the, the, the curatorial effort had been to identify all the work that had been done in, in this interim period uh, that relied on computers in a kind of intrinsic way and uh, to exclude all the work that was done in a conventional way. So, so it was a, it, it was a, a show of, of a kind of digital effort of the kind that I'd been speaking of since the middle of the 80s, uh, at least. So it was a kind of vindication, personally, for me that you know the kinds of things that I'd been saying were actually there. And um, I, I was invited to participate with a piece called Allobile, which I'll describe um, uh, momentarily. The 2000 piece was Invisible Architectures. Uh, it was uh, things like this, computational composition, uh, genetic algorithms, information theory, uh, something about how space-time leads to archi music, architecture and music, uh, which then leads to liquid architectures and navigable music, trans architectures, non-Euclidean space. These, all these things were in the 2000 piece. Um, by 2004, uh, I was talking about the aloe that I mentioned to you uh, in relation to biology, uh, which added to the conversation nanotech, biotech, new materials, new atomism, which are, uh, or alloatomism, which I'll talk about more today, and things like neurophysiology, phenomenology, world making, and eventually the notion that not only would we build architecture, but we would actually come to grow it with all of these things, producing a new species uh, of, of architecture. Now, what was curious was that when I got to Venice to actually install the piece, um, I, you know, I had no idea where it would be put. I mean, they said, send it over, I sent it over. Uh, there were these three very long rooms, uh, which, of course, you can understand uh, have a very strong axial bias, and the, the, the sort of focal point of that line was at the very end of the room. And these were the pieces that I, that I proposed. So I, so I had been placed at, at the kind of end of this vector, uh, which of course satisfied me, because the alibio piece for me was a statement of how all these other things had already been done conceptually. Uh, it was great that they were being accepted pragmatically, but the discussion itself, the argument, the, you know, where, where this kind of theoretical effort was going, was already on its way out of the room. It was, really, it was already at the end of, of this story. It was very interesting to me that Kurt Forster had actually picked that up. And what this thing was, what these things were, grew out of, out of uh, a series of studies that, that started off as being biomathematical, went on to being rapid prototype, and had to do with uh, new materials and the relationship of, of nanotech to biotech and how you would envision uh, things that, a, a kind of architecture that was never conceived as something that you would build, but it was more something that you would grow. Uh, and it produced uh, this kind of beast, uh, which uh, in a more orthographic view uh, looks like this, but it has all the kinds of layerings and interior space and structural parts and translucencies and enclosures. I mean, the, the language, the architectural language that you would expect is all present, but, but it's all been uh, taken to this perhaps uh, absurd uh, extreme. Um, and so for the, for, the, for the piece in the Biennale, this thing was rapid prototyped with, um, uh, in this case, a technology that relies on powder and uh, Prints. Uh, well, let me let me say this. I'll say this again because some more images will will come back. But let me sort of uh, prime it by saying that uh, there's a printing technology that prints on a kind of plaster with a hardening agent, and then accumulates layers upon layers. But it, but in essence, uh, proceeds particle by particle because it's a particulate kind of matter, and that 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 part is is what's interesting to us. Um, so um, the, the story of this, uh, which I don't want to lose, 
it, it goes back to um, probably 1979, certainly the 80s, and the beginnings of things that eventually came to be known as cyberspace, and the premonition that there would be architecture in that space. At the time, neither the words you existed nor the conceptual structure for this existed, but again, in just last week's news in, on CNN, and on the BBC for that matter, there was a report of, uh, of multi-user uh, environments on the web that exist now, three-dimensional multi-user environments that this was a premonition of, uh, now having uh, 20 million occupants and uh, having people conduct their businesses and actually be, be employed in, in there and having economies and having even uh, a currency and an exchange rate to the, to the dollar. So you have so many units of money in this world and um, you can exchange them for dollars back and forth and so on. So basically an alternative economy being developed in, in a virtual space, which is some kind of metric of reality. Now, um, I'm not going to unpack all of this. There are too many, too many words, but I'll, I'll try to quickly take you through it. Uh, liquid architecture is where some of these terms uh, originate, at least in, in, uh, in how people know what I've been up to, uh, is a kind of architecture, but also a kind of po poetic methodology, uh, but also an observation about culture in the sense that you can't articulate ideas unless the culture that you're in is already uh, prefigured in, in some sense uh, to accept them or to enable them. So to be able to say this, it had to be that the culture I was in could permit that to be said and, and to make, make sense. Um, it's part of a variety, a kind of growing list of uh, media, liquid architecture, navigable music, spatial, spatial music, disembodied dance, habitable cinema, uh, uh, all of them coming from an observation that when space and time were separate, you had the art of space or, or architecture and the art of time or music. But when space-time, in, in Einstein's terms, uh, became combined, the separate categories, I guess the Kantian categories too, uh, became combined into archie music, which uh, would be the sum of a temporalized architecture that you might call liquid architecture and a spatialized music that you might call navigable music. But the, 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 the notion is really an ongoing, uh, 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 ongoingly pertinent uh, way of looking at things. So, for example, life itself, the phenomenon of life, re requires DNA and mutation and is both a combination of rigor and agility. Uh, so those are all part of this thing. And then there's, there's, a, there's a big and ongoing question, persistent question, about uh, the, the, the whole argument between uh, being and nothingness and zero and one, integer and real, discrete and continuous, wave and particle, and, and a lot about quanta and qualia, the countable versus the qualitative, and, and many of these other things that you see here, that it's a kind of holy grail of uh, a, a problem that we can't seem to resolve, um, being finite in a seemingly infinite universe, which is another way of saying the very same thing. Um, so um, th those things carried the conversation to a certain point, and uh, we're moving into transvergence and the aloe, which I alluded to, and uh, something called speciation. All right. Um, so uh, you saw this, this exponential graph already from, from Kurzweil's graphs. The observation that's added here is that in the historical past, there would have been a lot of time to absorb a little bit of uh, technological change. Uh, in the present, we're finding less and less time to absorb more and more change. And that strains definitions, it strains theories, it strains institutions, it strains our own formation. The, um, uh, the um, no, let, let, me just, let me just continue with, with that. Um, Added to that, and, and here you might, you might uh, start superimposing the graphs together. You might imagine this, this, uh, this curve, this exponential curve, and, and the knee of the curve, the, the, the point where the inflection and changes and the, the acceleration begins to shift to, to mostly vertical, uh, being right there. So you have the curve, in a sense, running through here and, and giving this kind of uh, point. 
Now, this is a, an image, uh, as many of these images are, this is an image taken from space-time physics, uh, something called the Minkowski light cones. These cones describe the distance that light could travel given a certain uh, amount of time from the present. So if I were a second away in the past, light could travel a second's distance. If I were half a second away, it would travel half as far. A quarter of a second away, it would travel a quarter as far until finally in the present it would have time to travel not at all. And likewise for the future. And what the diagram describes is the realm of the knowable versus the, the realm of the, of the unknown. Uh, under the assumption that to know something you have to reach it, you have to sense it in some way, and if the fastest thing that can reach something is light, and light can't even reach it, then how could you know it? Uh, that is known as elsewhere. And so you know Milan Kundera and light is elsewhere. It's kind of an allusion to, to that, that idea that uh, the majority of reality is somehow out there and we're constrained into this sort of cone of what's, what's the known. Um, but there is, there is one more thing to note though, that, that time is actually not a straight line as we understand it. It's this curved uh, line which is caused by the curvature of space-time and the curvature of space-time is caused by the presence of mass. So this is, this is what we, t you know, this is the story that we tell ourselves anyway it, uh, with whatever evidence we can, we can gather. But what that means is that even though there, there are things that are unknown, nature, the, the nature of the space that we're in already is bending towards something and so we can detect it as a kind of trend or a kind of presence uh, even if we can't literally see it. Uh, it's in the metric of the space that we're in. Now, uh, that leads to, to these kinds of diagrams that, that uh, I, I keep on showing because they're, I, I still find them to be quite explanatory. Uh, so, um, I've taken the, the, the same construct and instead of uh, having the present here, I've said basis. And instead of uh, the, 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 the lines from the cone, I have convergence and divergence. Uh, especially, but not only, in terms of media, you have uh, the idea that things are converging upon a basis, and it's fairly straightforward to assume that things will diverge afterwards. Now, the convergence in this case is that, uh, let's say, an architect and a musician are both picking up digital tools, and the basis is the digital, and that they'll continue. Now, here's what happens. Uh, an architect picks up some digital tools and continues to make the same architecture that he or she would have made before. Nothing new has happened. Right? I can use new tools and make old work. Uh, or uh, a musician does the same thing. Uh, that's degree zero. Nothing has happened. Uh, degree one might be that um, the musician is a little bit more daring than the architect, and uh, he or she picks up the tools, realizes that they now give access to spatial operations, and decides to make something architectonic but does so in a conventional way. So it's new to this person that they should be making, they should be musicians making something spatial, but in the end, what they're making is the same stuff that, they would have, that a conventional person would have made anyway. So uh, adopted this way, the diagrams show a kind of area of the known uh, and conventional versus the area of something more interesting. Uh, the, the proposition, I should go forward one, uh, the proposition is, is uh, that, that another possibility is present and preferable, which is that at that moment of things converging on this basis, there's a strategic opportunity to derail the expected path into the, the unknown. And so instead of convergence and di divergence, what I'm proposing is this thing called transvergence, uh, which requires a rather willful act of derailment by something external to, the what, to what you know. So you bring in to what you know things that you don't and you, you thrust them against your own, your own inclination and you, you allow that to push you into a new direction. And, and then uh, there's the recognition that the digital is one wave and it's to be followed by the nanotechnological, the biotechnological, the neurotech, the robotech, the quant, quantotech, uh, various kinds of waves uh, of things that we're bringing upon ourselves that don't seem to be stopping, they seem to be accelerating as, as, uh, as this sort of singularity thinking 
uh, uh, document, and that basically it becomes a matter of choice whether or not to, to behave within the envelope of the known for what you do, or whether to choose to derail yourself and transverge, uh, and if you were to do so, whether or not to do so once, or whether to elect to always do so, because the situation will come up again, and at this point there'll be a new opportunity to transverge, and at this point there'll be a new opportunity to transverge, and so on. So this becomes a kind of choice of uh, how to be, a kind of stance um, uh, for how to be in the face of accelerating change. Um, now, uh, one way to describe this whole effort is through a reference to uh, biology and sort of Dar Darwinian uh, evolutionary biology. And uh, indeed, one way to think of this portion of what I'm talking about is to think of it as the, uh, let's say, the allobiology of innovation. Um, this diagram shows uh, what happens in, uh, in, the normal, uh, in the normal development of a species and how it is that you get a new species to, to evolve. So the, the normal operation is that you have a species that's growing. Uh, we know, we tell ourselves again, and we, we show ourselves that there are mutations, and then various things can happen to these mutations. One of them is that mutations uh, are non-viable, so they rapidly become extinct. Another is that they regress, and even though they're mutations for a short while, the albino squirrel produces regular squirrels, and they go back into the existing uh, species. The, the third possibility is that you produce a hybrid, which is, uh, let's say, uh, a mule, which is a combination of a horse and a donkey. Now, uh, a hybrid like a mule is useful and viable in a certain sense. I mean, we use them and need them and feed them and care of them, but they don't reproduce any further. So a mule cannot produce another mule. We always need to go back to the original horse and donkey to make a new one so, because they're sterile. So you have to always restart uh, those kinds of things. The final option is that the, the mutation remains viable up to a certain point such that, and that's when you actually get speciation, such that it is both viable and incompatible with its own kind. So you, you create a creature that can now only reproduce with its own kind and can no longer reproduce with the parent species. Someplace in the past it was of such a kind, but eventually it, it wasn't. And when that happens, the existing species can continue, but a new species has been created and diversity has increased. And this is, this is uh, uh, the evolution of diversity or uh, as uh, uh, Darwin would have said, the origin of species uh, versus the, the, uh, the fitness of things, which is how we incorrectly uh, interpret uh, evolution. Now, th this actually has a lot to do with being an architect in, the, in a digital time, because in a certain sense, this, this diagram is uh, autobiographical, or it's a kind of self-portrait, because I came through a kind of uh, architectural education mutated with the digital and the musical and all sorts of other kinds of things, apparently did not become extinct. Uh, uh, apparently, uh, uh, hopefully, I'm not uh, a sterile hybrid. It seemed not to be. And I, haven't, I certainly haven't regressed. Uh, what, what has happened, indeed, is that I've actually continued to the point which other people have also mutated with whom I can have certain kinds of conversations and produce and pursue certain kinds of work uh, and discuss that work in a way that I can't with the people that continued along this line. That I have a certain conceptual apparatus in place that I share with, let's say, people like, like uh, Mark uh, Goulthorpe and, and the, the, the people that I mentioned to you and, and many others and probably many of you here now uh, that uh, I probably could not share with uh, a lot of the people that taught me or a lot of my, my my fellow students and even present colleagues. I mean, there, there's, there's a kind of uh, uh, splitting of the ways, which isn't necessarily bad. It simply produces more diversity in, in the world. So speciation winds up being an interesting thing, and it becomes a kind of desirable condition. And so uh, 
one of the one of the goals of the various kinds of efforts that I'm showing you and will show you is now the self-conscious uh, search for a kind of speciation of architecture, of disciplines, of knowledge, of even epistemologies and uh, and ways of being. The, the, the kind of understanding that uh, we may have come to a condition culturally where the production of diversity is now becoming more important to us uh, than the production of fitness and uh, that in any case we have to contend with it because even if we want to do it analytically or, or in terms of a kind of scholarship or, or, uh, or uh, record keeping of this event uh, or, or of this cultural cluster, uh, we would still need to uh, pay attention to, some, to, to the fact that something is changing. When you finally combine this with the singularity, uh, it, it becomes even more pressing because there are indications that it's going to be quite profound, whether it happens in 30 years or 300. That doesn't quite matter. It seems to be coming, and it seems to be quite, uh, quite powerful. Now, uh, this, this whole story uh, then leads to, uh, to, to all sorts of lessons that one might learn. Uh, one of them is that if you, if you begin to study evolution, you realize that it's a machine for, for moving forward without knowing where you're going. Uh, you, you, can, you can see this little link. I, I don't have that information on the computer to show you, but you can, you can see that and, uh, and see something that you'll enjoy. Uh, but it, it's an interesting uh, study to figure out how you would proceed without preconceiving where you're, where you're going. Um, now, a lot of the things that I've been doing so far have, have used genetic uh, algorithms, uh, literally, in artificial life and various kinds of things. And so the, the challenge becomes how would you apply those, those kinds of ideas, not only to the evolution of objects, but eventually to the evolution of ideas themselves. And how would you uh, uh, harness all this, all this power that we're building uh, for something that we've assumed for a very long time is strictly human uh, if you set aside the arrogance that it's strictly human and you allow, you allow the possibility that we might augment ourselves even in that way. Um, now, uh, this I'm going to uh, uh, I'm going to try to go through through quickly. Uh, this in intersects with the notion of beauty, and in in that it contends with the problem uh, not only of the objectivity of beauty that I that I uh, suggested earlier with that uh, uh, that image, uh, but also with the extensions to ourselves. The aesthetic has to do with that which pertains to the senses. Aesthesis is literally sense in Greek. Um, but then what happens when you turn the, uh, the view of mimesis to the future? Uh, many, I won't say most, but, but many understandings of beauty uh, seem to be predicated on a kind of comparative and repetitive uh, uh, way of uh, saying that the beauty that, that beauty is uh, is mimetic, representational, uh, it, 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 it's it's cast in in a non-generative uh, manner, uh, in a more passive manner, and in a manner that that looks to an ideal in the past. Um, in in the kinds of things that uh, I'm curious about, I see a condition where what's coming from the future is coming to us very very rapidly. We don't know what it is, and uh, we need to have a, 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 a beauty uh, that is appropriate to that condition, and therefore an aesthetics that is not about mimesis but is an allo aesthetics. In a, in a certain sense, I've gathered, uh, uh, I, I just have a few examples this way, uh, but I've gathered some, some images of things that, that, that indicate that or uh, indicate that maybe that, that uh, view is already in formation amongst us. But even if you go in the past, you find uh, the, the sense of the objective, uh, even in Alberti, beauty is the reasoned harmony of all the parts, such that nothing may be added, taken, or altered, uh, that it's in the object itself, um, or even in uh, Thomas Aquinas, uh, where beauty relates to a cognitive power, uh, its due proportion, uh, the sense of delight in things duly proportioned, but eventually here he comes because the sense, too, is a sort of reason, as is every cognitive power. Uh, the, the, the placement of the beautiful 
uh, in the epistemological and therefore in that which can also be constructed. Um, now, this, uh, this articulates what I've just said in, in some, uh, some more detail. If you can scan it fast enough, uh, please do. I, I don't think I want to uh, explain all of it. Uh, th uh, th this little cluster of words here uh, has to do with uh, the notion that there is meaning before language, before taxonomy, before discourse, uh, and that it's somehow multimodal. This might tie us back to the rhizomatic and the particular in the sense of being made of particles. Uh, here, again, I won't, uh, I won't expand on this if you can see it or if you want to see it later on. These are references in literature uh, of, uh, of places where you can, you can find quite a bit of information about this in neural plasticity in the visual brain, in uh, the space of qualia and neural Darwinism, um, but also in Vannevar Bush's very famous article called As We May Think and the possibility of augmenting the human and then of course in uh, Richard Feynman's uh, 1958 uh, declaration of the space of nanotech. Um, so, uh, okay, th th this, this has to do with creating an objective beauty that is not only theoretical or empirical, but also experimental. Uh, I, I won't expand all this, uh, what I, because I want to get to, to more things, and I'm, I, I know this can take quite a long time. Um, so, um, I want to show you some, uh, some, uh, some videos that I think uh, indicate this, this uh, other kind of aesthetic, an aesthetic that is not predicated on the known, but is exploring something uh, alien. Um, this is a piece called uh, Growl uh, by Robert Seidel. There's a website. Uh, it's about 20 minutes long, so we won't watch all of it. Uh, I hope the sound is up. Yes.
seeing them as worlds and not as uh, not not in the filmic uh, realm, but in the realm of, of spaces uh, that you can you can actually uh, go to. Now, uh, this continues in a in this kind of constantly uh, metamorphic uh, way, and it's really quite beautiful, and it it, it elaborates uh, in, in surprising ways. Um, this one uh, being the uh, three-dimensional projections of four-dimensional quaternional fractals. Um, quite a mouthful. Uh, but again, also, please see it as, uh, as a place and not as a, not as a movie. So there's the equation that it comes from. And notice that they're, they're, the, the sound is not making sense. Let me, let me bring this uh, a little closer to things that I've been doing and then to things that I've been doing with my group. Um, uh, a, a series of uh, 
of efforts, each, one, each of them partial, but, but trying to accumulate information for a larger uh, understanding. Uh, each of these efforts has something to do with uh, the very small and, and the construction of, of the world from the very small under the assumption that the very small is not necessarily what we find in the world. It might itself be a fiction or an invention. So this is from computational fluid dynamics using some software called Real Flow. Uh, I'll run the simulation twice. Uh, initially, you see some structures that look quasi-simplistically architectonic, and then something that looks liquid, and then a mass that comes upon everything and makes it fall. Uh, now, a, a couple of things to be said about it. First of all, it's not an animation. Uh, it's actually a simulation, and it makes a world of difference to realize that it's not an animation and it's a simulation. Because if it were an animation, someone would, would say what everything should do, but the world within which everything behaves uh, wouldn't have any uh, of its own laws, any of its own physics. Uh, in, in the case of what this actually is, uh, there's only a beginning condition uh, that there should be uh, these forms, that there should be a, a mass, and that there should be, sorry, I have to do this two times so it doesn't start. Uh, there, there should be a source of water. From there on, everything behaves with actual gravity and the actual uh, physics of, uh, of fluids uh, as they're modeled computationally. Now, the reason I'm showing it is because I'm interested in a kind of shift of attention from the conventionally architectural to saying that this is architecture to saying that that is architecture in our time and that I would like to know how to create architecture from that understanding, not from this. Uh, this is another instance of the same kind of thing now done more playfully uh, so that the liquids aren't behaving uh, like liquids uh, would. Uh, but, but again, with the notion that I, I want to be able to model that, this is already a given. Uh, and uh, this, this uh, here, for, for instance, is uh, a design for a dome, let's say, or a study for how a dome would, would emerge. Uh, from a simple uh, circular uh, source of liquids that fell on a particular kind of obstacle, this kind of cruciform uh, object, and then that the, the interaction of these forms would create these interference patterns of, of resistance as, as the particles of water flowed and, and resisted or flowed differentially on the differences of the, of the form to create striations which I think you can recognize quite simply and, and directly as being similar both in, in nature and proportion to the kinds of things that many domes around the world already do. The kind of sense that, that some of the things that we actually build into the environment are, are premonitions or responses to phenomena in, in the world. Uh, this is a, a kind of study where one set of algorithms produces uh, an angular form and for the sake of contrast uh, the, the, uh, for the sake of contrast. And, and then another set, this kind of computational fluid dynamics form, creates a roof structure that is made of these uh, liquids. So you have a, a kind of draping liquid uh, roof structure over an angularly developed uh, substructure. Uh, and it, it just falls, uh, falls off. We'll see this again as a, as a kind of uh, built form. But here, here you have the particular in terms of, of uh, the particles of liquids, the kind of sense of of uh, the water that I showed you being actually dry, uh, not, not being water at all. Uh, part of being in Santa Barbara and part of being uh, part of the California Nanosystems Institute is that I can collaborate with biologists and chemists and physicists and, and people of this sort. So I'm collaborating with someone named Luke Yeager, who is a molecular biologist who works with, with RNA uh, and uh, working on, on uh, sculpting with RNA. Uh, using it as a kind of Lego. Uh, it, the, the, the setup is that there's actually a molecular assembler that builds new molecules given some kind of grammatical information. And uh, the grammatical information is generative, so if I write an algorithm that can write the right sequence uh, and it's fed into the right machine with the knowledge that he provides, we can produce a finished molecule, which is an architectural composition. In order to do so, there's a great deal of stuff that needs to happen at this end, like 3D sensing and tracking, virtual reality, scientific visualization, and so on. And at the other end, because this is invisible, you need to, to bring it back to human scale uh, to either sonify it or visualize it or prototype it 
or make an installation uh, of it, uh, but somehow uh, make something that is that, that would fit 10,000 times in the width of a human hair, uh, bring it back to the scale that we, we, we would make. Now, if I showed you this, you would assume that it's entirely fantastic, but it really isn't. And so this is an atomic force microscope scan of a molecule being, being persuaded uh, to, to be a Lego piece. And then here you have two of them uh, creating an elementary square. And then here you have a composite image which shows uh, in, with computer graphics what these molecules are doing. These are the pieces of, of uh, RNA that happen to have uh, th the feature of having right angles and uh, the, the, uh, the added convenient feature that they can be entangled in, in this ways with other molecules of, of the right kind to make these forms. And that you can actually persuade them to make the, the letter pi or a cross. And this is, this is the actual scan of the actual molecule. And this is a computer graphic to explain what that is. And then here you see additional uh, 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 fabrics now, uh, elementary you know, nanoscale fabrics that uh, are corresponding to these configurations, uh, as you can see. So these are molecules that have been persuaded to do what these things are showing. And uh, the, the idea being that uh, through a sequence of steps, uh, you, you build the appropriate layers and you stack them and you can then build this kind of nanoscale uh, architectonic uh, structure, which of course for the scientists is a proof of concept that they have that control and for the architect uh, it is a kind of avant-garde impossible architecture that we all uh, like so much. Uh, God forbid that we build it. Uh, but who knows with the price of rent these days, that might be the only place you can afford. Um, now, this leads us to, to uh, the, uh, the, the Allo Atomic, uh, which, which I, I mentioned uh, in this article, if you can find it, and with the notion of new atomism and uh, uh, th this following recognition. Most of the things that we're making, uh, whether we draw them or, or even if we model them on the computer, are made more or less this way. They're made with the assumption of being made of more or less pre-existing uh, wholly formed parts, in this case, uh, polygons, uh, things in some sense, uh, whole uh, things. And they, they can be persuaded to, to be configured in various kinds of ways. But if, if I look at this lectern and I actually think about what it's made of as I know it to be from the science that, that my culture provides me, it turns out that it's not solid and it's actually made of molecules, and as I said earlier, right at the beginning, it's actually mostly space and, and not so much matter. You know, it, 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 the fact that it seems to be dense is that there are more things there than in the air, but the air itself isn't empty either. If it were, I would suffocate. You know, the fact that I can, I can live is, is uh, evidence to the fact that the air is not empty. It just appears to be if I'm not thinking. So uh, in terms of how we make things, we've been making things with a, a, a way of making that is not really congruent with the way we know the world, and that's, that's interesting. Uh, this way of making the same form would be a little closer. It would be that form made now of, uh, of particles, right? And this is, these are chosen to be this shape relatively arbitrarily, but basically, in order to make it, I have to write the software that places, places all of them in the right uh, position. Uh, what we actually know is, actu is more like this, that, that uh, the, the air around us uh, is made of random, randomly arranged particles. And if I encounter something that is dense, it means that what was randomness, like if this were an empty space, it would all be random. But if I find out that I'm moving my hand and I run into something, it means that some portion of the space has been densified, has somehow been modulated, that the, the, the randomness has somehow been altered. And so one way to visualize it, to explain it maybe, is that, that this is closer to what the world around us is like. It's a modulation of densities rather than, than the presence or absence of things. Every place is full of, of, uh, of particles, uh, not literally full as in, as in having no space, but particles are present and distributed everywhere. Some of them are, are in clusters, some of them are not, some of them are dense, some of them are not, some of them have different uh, characteristics and others have others. And that makes forms appear. So uh, playing with that kind of notion leads to a, a kind of formal language that, 
that begins to look like like this. Uh, but but eventually, you know, you're just playing with these things uh, further. Uh, but eventually, uh, uh, goes a few steps further. Now, let me let me make a, an allusion to to sound. You all have CDs and, and MP3s and digital sound that you work with. You're all familiar with that. And so perhaps you know that what's on on your hard disk or on your CD or DVD uh, are actually just samples. There is no sound. There is no sound wave. Uh, what's on there are simply uh, many, many records of intensities sampled thousands of times per second. Right? So there, there, there's this intense uh, sampling. And from that sampling that could register silence or degrees of loudness, and that's all, uh, you can reconstitute anything you want to hear. Now, you also probably all know about electronic music. I would doubt that any of you don't. And so you know that there's actually a history that goes back um, you know, 60 years of, of the making of such sound and a whole series of developments that have altered our understanding of music itself. Now, I would propose to you that the same thing has been happening to some extent to art culture, but it's about to, to become supercharged by the advent of, of these kinds of machines that do rapid prototyping. So here's, here's a, a rather ambiguous image, I hope, of something black and something not so black. Uh, let's, let's see what, what that is and why I'm showing it to you. Now, as, we, as we move back, you, you may begin to see that it's, it's a form. And you may begin to see that it's actually made of these particles. And you may, you may begin to see that it's that composed thing that I showed uh, earlier, which is rapid prototypes. Now, the reason I'm showing it to you in this way is to suggest to you that the kinds of operations that we've been using on digital sound and eventually the digital image and all the things that you do in Photoshop are about to jump into the third dimension. In fact, from a, from a kind of vernacular uh, understanding, have already done so. These machines already exist. That's why I can show you this. They've not yet become architectonic problems. And what I'm proposing to you is that they need to become architectonic problems. And in this case, this object is using a fairly conventional architectural language, uh, uh, even though it still is one piece, and most buildings aren't one piece. Uh, it, its sort of formal language is pretty much uh, familiar. This one is a little, bit, a little bit different in the sense that it's not only continuous, but it's also continuously uh, variable. It's a little bit closer to the the allobiological thing that I showed you uh, before, uh, and a little bit closer to the kind of conception that, that I'm trying to suggest to you is more in keeping with, with, uh, with this uh, technological understanding that we've, we've developed. This one here is even, even closer uh, to it in the sense that it's both uh, con conceptually particular and then also in terms of its execution made of these kinds of uh, sub now uh, we're going to take it. We're going to turn the screw a few more twists before we're we're done. So let, let's keep on moving. Uh, one of the projects I've been invited to participate in, participate in is for the Mac Center, uh, the, the Schindler House, and uh, it's a project called Gen Home or Genome, Gene Home Genome. Uh, the Schindler House is this orthodox modernist uh, structure. Very very nice. I really like it very much. And what I proposed was to put that kind of structure that you saw before inside it. And to do so, uh, to, to have to do it. Something to come that's going to be uh, richer still. Um, I, I won't explain this. This has to do with doing all of this in Hollywood. Now, this is actually not real rock. Uh, it is uh, simu not simulated. It's actually copied rock from, 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 a, real, uh, from a real site uh, with foam blown and just a whole art for, for, for stealing nature. Uh, in a sense, I'm critical of this, and I'm proposing that, that you don't want to imitate nature. You simply want to create a different one. Uh, uh, this set of experiments here have to do with uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, and uh, a collaboration with the UCLA Brain Mapping Center, where I've actually uh, 
had myself stand, I sit on this bed and put my brain in there, and uh, then uh, th these are the, the, the canonical ways of seeing a, a brain and seeing the activation of a brain, uh, and uh, these red regions, this, is, this, this happens to be someone else's brain, but this is mine, uh, so this is the, <laughs> this is the speaker. Uh, the fault is someplace in here, I imagine. Um, and uh, there's, another, there's another view of that. Th these are the ways that, uh, that science and medicine uh, look at us these days, and these are the true self-portraits of, of us in, in, in a certain way. Um, but uh, uh, I've been looking at them for, for other uh, reasons, which, I, which I'll slowly begin to reveal. Uh, but when I showed my, my collaborators in the, in the Brain Mapping Center even, even this, and then began to explore the spaces inside here, they were quite surprised. And, and, and they thought they knew much about the brain, but they were really quite uh, unaware that, you, you know, if you saw these places, if you saw this as a place and as a space and as with, a, with an architectural spatial eye, you would find uh, a different kind of uh, interest. Um, we'll, we'll come back to, th these are the very early ones, I'll come back to some, uh, some of these that are quite more developed uh, at, the, at the end of this, but the, uh, the, the, this is beginning to intersect now with something else that we're doing uh, in something called the, uh, the allosphere uh, at Santa Barbara, which uh, is a three-story high sphere uh, that, uh, that uh, a person can stand in on a bridge. Let me... Uh, uh, let me break the illusion momentarily and show you a bit of that and we'll return to this sequence. Um, so this is a Uh, the building is, uh, well, the, the, the spheres that I'm interested in, the building is actually by, uh, uh, oh, what's his name? <laughs> oh, God. Um, complexity and contradiction analysis from um, in a different uh, era. Uh, Robert Venturi. Um, but uh, the, the sphere itself is this kind of Boolean sphere. There's a bridge in the middle that people can stand on, and there's 3D stereoscopic projection in the round in the sphere three-dimensional sound. The prefix allo is that it's intended to simulate uh, or create uh, environments that are not representational but that are inherently uh, other and uh, that are at the intersection of this, uh, this being an instrument uh, for science or an instrument for art. Uh, th there are these, this dual sense of, of uh, what an instrument uh, is that are uh, embodied in it. And it, it occupies all of this block sphere that you basically in there, and that's the, the building, which is now virtually complete. Uh, this should be operating uh, by next uh, spring, and this is a, a sort of cavernous space where the sphere will be housed. This was done last spring, so the sphere isn't present, but you can get a sense of the, of the scale of this, uh, this beast. Um, now, uh, I'm, I'm going to break out of this and go back to the, uh, the, the main thread. waiting for us here, and uh, to suggest that the, the, the brain images have something to do with creating a feedback loop in the sphere, whereby a subject uh, is presented with information which comes from making worlds out of the data from the brain, such that it changes the brain, and then goes back and creates the world. And you would be in this, in this sphere uh, both seeing uh, at one moment being able to see an objective description of what's happening in your brain, and in a, at another moment being able to see a kind of phenomenological rendition of what is going on in the brain in a kind of world-making sense. Now, presumably, uh, this, uh, this may be getting to the point where it's strange enough to, to warrant being called transvergent and to being in this, in this area that, that is uh, hard, to, uh, hard to classify. This is, a, this is the image of it now, a little bit less uh, uh, mobile, so you can actually focus on it. There's a catwalk around it. There's an array of speakers that create something like uh, 
300,000 virtual possible speakers, virtual speakers, but you can, you can isolate sound in, uh, in a variety of ways. And uh, this is the construct of, of how this thing works. There's a person, there are devices that sense the person, uh, 3D tracking sensing and so on. Uh, then there's, there's a whole cluster of computers for scientific visualization and simulation. Uh, that goes to uh, another set of clusters that make visual and, and audio world making and different kinds of processing that finally leads into a set of devices that, that create haptic displays, visual and auditory displays, and finally that gets fed back to the person. Now all of that is a kind of cycle that's necessary for creating an alternative reality. But what's, what's interesting to us today are these little particles uh, that uh, are, are the, the allo uh, atomic that I've been, I've been leading to. Now we're not going to conclude quite yet. We're going to go to, to two more things and we'll be done. It's, it, we're almost there. So if, you're, if you're patient, your patience, I hope, will be rewarded. Uh, so um, let me um, let me get to uh, we'll we'll look at some more images and then we'll we'll look at some programs and we'll be done uh, and, and and that's all quick uh, actually there's one main program that, that, that we want to see uh, I said I would show you a little bo bit more of these these brain uh, scans made as uh, spaces so you saw these. Uh, now here, these are the, the spaces of my brain, literally, like taking, taking out uh, the things that, that are indifferent and, or adding things that are more relevant and finding structures inside there and then rendering them uh, as spaces or alternatively uh, looking at them uh, as, as potential physical forms uh, or ambiguously so. Uh, you begin to find things such as, such as this. Uh, here, uh, again, this is the brain, but, but filtered and processed and rendered so as to give a, a kind of structural uh, possibility, and, and then, but then also a kind of language uh, that, that comes directly from the data. So presumably you see the resemblance. Uh, here's, a, here's a little bit of going inside. And then these are, these are uh, uh, again, it's, it's the same data, but now processed and filtered slightly differently to produce more smoothness and, and a kind of yet, yet uh, different uh, language. This, these images are, are slightly, they're, they're related. These, this is the, these are the stimuli that caused the brain to act that became the, the, the objects that you saw. Uh, the, the, they're part of an effort that combines this neurological data and experimentation with something architectural and visual to become, now this is hard to say all at once when you try to count the words, uh, uh, to become a, a, a high definition video to be televised over cable television in the United States for a channel called uh, 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 MOOV uh, and a program called Lab HD um, that has uh, 24 hours of non narrative video. It's like a, like a high definition television channel that uh, only, uh, only shows this kind of stuff. Now, it's interesting because many of the people who work with me are musicians and if you're an electronic musician you have a new form, a new expressive form, but you always deliver it in a concert hall, which is an old venue it's like there's a dislocation and what's happened in the meantime is that people have been developing the technology for having uh, four times this resolution on their TV screen and not having any content for it and that becomes an architectural problem because the venue becomes distributed it becomes a musical problem because the venue for the, for the music it becomes uh, distributed as well. There is no theater. It becomes architectonic in a virtual sense because these things are also uh, uh, spatial. So uh, what I, one of the things I did this summer was make, made, in effect, 250,000 paintings, which are uh, these, these things in a very, very slowly, sort of ambiently moving uh, virtual environment that 
could run for hours, and you could watch it if you like, or you could just let it be on your wall and look at it whenever you want. Kind of like if you like Brian Eno and, and that kind of stuff, you might appreciate that this is a kind of uh, visual equivalent. And of course, that that takes on the the, uh, the atomic notions that I have and that I've been describing, but also shows that there there is something in all of this implicit in in the very small, whether it's pixels or atoms or, or neurons, uh, implicit is very high number. And when you get to, from the very small to the very high number, you simply can't conceive or do things by hand. You have to do them uh, with some other uh, kind of uh, mechanism. Now, this goes on uh, for a long time, and it has, it has you know, moments and moments and moments, and it, it transforms, but I, I'm going to interrupt myself interrupt it and show you something that's live before we conclude. Um, so, because this, this I'm showing you as a movie. And so what I want to, uh, I think, uh, conclude with is a program, which is actually quite a, a simple program, but a program that I find quite compelling that a student of mine wrote um, that is, I if I can find it, Um, that brings a lot of these things together. Uh, and it, it connects also to uh, physics and uh, string theory, if you know that uh, at all. If you don't, you might want to. Uh, the, 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 the brief description is that up to a certain point in time, we thought of atoms as being things. Then we realized that they have inner structure and they were subatomic particles. And then as, as we've been looking farther and farther, it turns out that what's at the core of them might be higher dimensional, as many as 11 spatial dimensions might be involved. And they might not be particles at all. They might be better thought of as tiny little strings that are, like, you can imagine them as rubber bands that are vibrating, except that they're vibrating in many dimensions. And uh, the reality is the construct that emerges by all these vibrations and their interactions. So you have these sort of little strings vibrating and, and only being able to vibrate at certain frequencies and then the accumulation, the sort of musical accumulation of all this being reality as we know it. Now, before I show you the, the, the final little video, I want to try to pull this all together. The allosphere that I showed you is a place for making virtual environments. And I showed you those little dots that I said were kind of alloatomic. Now, what you can conceive of at this point, which I think is where a lot of these efforts finally focus and where I would want to leave you with, is a condition which draws upon how we know the world. And a lot of the work that I've been doing and, and talking about really draws upon a conception of architecture that's really pretty ancient. Like for example, Guarino Guarini being more of a cosmologist than an architect, or Christopher Wren for that matter, and many others besides, really drawing upon how the world they were born in knew the world, kind of cosmological and epistemological uh, sense for architecture. So these efforts are a way of finding what the current cosmology and epistemology are and trying to derive from it what one might do uh, architecturally. And if I find my culture knowing the world as being made of superstrings in higher dimensional space, uh, how do I construct an architecture that is congruent with that? And if I find consciousness to be made of, of uh, neural uh, connections and neurophysiology, how do I build that in? And if I find that the material reality of the world is made uh, of, of new materials that we control nanotechnologically, how do I use that? And if I find that the virtual is made of pixels and voxels and such elements, how do I build with that? Okay, so I collect what my world knows, as I find it by being a citizen in it, and I try from it to construct the elements of an architecture. Now, uh, the sphere is a place where you can actually experiment with this, with the proposition that the way to answer my question, how do you do this, is not to, not to uh, imitate the constructs of the world, but as with every other thing that we've done architecturally, is to construct the appropriate fictions about it. And therefore, to question the elemental, to question the particular, and to propose another kind, to say that I'm not going to have an atom, I'm going to have an aloe atom, and from it, derive the world. Right? Try to figure what that element would be, and then build out from it. So when you get to this kind of sphere that we're, we're building, you would then imagine an element 
that would be not only spatial in three dimensions, but spatial in five, eight, 15, as many dimensions as you wanted. That would not only be visual or of color, but would also be of sound. That would not only be a question of being, but would also be a question of reading, it would sense. And to basically supercharge and super compress onto what that element is, all of the attributes that you might want in an eventual reality. And from there then, to extrapolate what might happen. Right? Now that is what we're trying to do, and we're trying to do it with all the different kinds of people that I've been talking about, and it, it takes a while, but we, we're actually building a device within which to be able to, to play with it. Now, what I'm going to show you is a very, very simple example of this uh, in, in actually three dimensions, uh, combining uh, music and, and uh, visuals and spatiality, but to give you a sense of how something that is made of particles uh, uh, will actually uh, fluctuate madly, but then, then coagulate and, and, and come together into momentary forms that can be stabilized and not, and to have you see it and hear it and, and just get a, a flavor for it, and, and perhaps try to then um, uh, allow that into your thinking and see where that leads you in the way you approach the different kinds of problems you, you approach. Not, not to give it to you as any kind of answer, but to give it to you as a challenge and as a possibility. So uh, uh, this thing is called uh, S-scale. something that, it, that, uh, that is nice, but it's hard to catch. So, and of course, you know, as soon as, as, soon as you all leave, I'll catch it, but, but it's, uh, uh, th there are moments when you can actually, right now it's, it's fluctuating uh, in its own crazy way, uh, but there are moments when you can actually see these little strings that are vibrating that are making it happen. 
um, and and it's really quite quite fun to to, to watch. Uh, we'll try restarting it just in case it decides to set itself up. Right. going to agree with me too much. It's nice enough that it came back. Is to not see it as a computer graphic uh, and not see it as something to, to make a representation of but to try to comprehend it as the stuff that we're making the world of, and to try to find the correlate of that into the making of this, understanding that in some time, when we're closer to that point of singularity, the materials in the world we, we make will be controlled by us if we, if we choose to see it as an architectural problem uh, at, at that kind of uh, level. With the problem that I'm having, you know, including—I mean—the problem is also part of the, part of the, part of the game. You know, that it may not behave as I want it. I want it to if I try to persuade it to with my, with my conventional approach to things. Um, so, with that, I think I'm going to uh, stop this. Hopefully, you had some appetite not only for food, but for concluding questions. There would be ones. I would welcome them. I don't know what time it is. But um, and I won't read you all this, but I will say that in conclusion, la 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 la, all this, uh, do that, and uh, better yet, do this. Uh, okay, well that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, um, we do have some time uh, for some questions. And, um, although they're quite often extremely difficult to elicit, I don't know what it is uh, about this place. So I'll kind of start off with one question. And it really kind of, you know, one way of asking it is to take up the last uh, stuff you showed, which I'm still a sufficient modernist <coughs> to call a representation. The, the and then, then when you say, you know, it's not helpful really to look at this as two-dimensional, uh, you know, he says, it's not helpful to look at this as two-dimensional. I uh, think of it as being three-dimensional. And then I feel like, you know, this is where we came in. Um, if someone was so studying, is really the other 
part of it. Like at a certain point in the lecture, uh, you began to discard, and I would be perfectly happy with it, to discard the category of mimesis, all that kind of old-fashioned stuff, uh, which was about representation of this, that, and the other. We don't want any of that. And the question really is, towards the end of the lecture, doesn't the category of mimesis return? But return this time uh, as a kind of relation between scientifically informed configuration and kind of making. That is to say, uh, is there a sense, maybe, maybe it's a, a strength to your argument, maybe it's a weakness, I don't know, but isn't there a sense in which at the end you're producing a kind of new mimesis? You say, you know, evocatively, this is the stuff of which stuff's made. But then I think, well, that's sort of what Vitruvius thought. Now, you may want to say he was wrong, but he wasn't doing it out of a theory of representation. He was doing it out of a sort of ontological theory of what at least he thought there was. So the question really is, and I think it, it's, it's, you know, it, it, I wouldn't just put it to you, I would put it to a number of people who might make some of the same kind of arguments. You put it in a kind of particularly eloquent way. But isn't it a new mimesis? Uh, I, would, I, would, uh, I would concede that uh, some or perhaps a lot of mimesis is uh, inevitable. You know, even if I would like to escape it, I, I still need to communicate, and I still need to to enact, and I can only do so with what's given, whether it's language or media or, or the tools that I have at hand. So some of it is is inevitable to me, and if I insist, if I were totally strict, then I would have to be totally quiet, and uh, maybe that would be. Uh, but but apart from that, uh, I think the difference between Vitruvius and something like proposing is in that prefix alum, that, that Vitruvius might have said, you know, this is the world as it is and let's build with it, but he wouldn't have had the drive or the impulse or the suspicion that we're actually very much implicated in the changing of the order of the world. And this is, is very much aware, you know, and can be argued, like, I mean, I can mean, be wrong, but, 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 but they might be involved in something but else. But just so there's a clarity, I completely agree, I completely accept that. But the change in the conception of the world is what you might call at a scientific level. I would. I well, or, you know, I don't. I don't want to be fussy about the term science. <laughs> I mean, it's. Well, there, there's it's two, there are two levels. levels. It's at a basis of knowledge. Now, that also goes back to what you might call the sort of second act of the question. You know, if you quoted Alberti. And that was fine, you know, for Alberti, the beauty of an object is the way in which the parts relate to the whole. But that stopped being the case at the end of the 18th century, where, as it were, and I think, I mean, this is one way of putting the question. To me, the kind of missing term in what you're saying is what Kant would call the subjective. Now, I don't confuse the subjective with consciousness. And obviously, you're very much concerned with kind of what you might call recent scientific philosophical conceptions of what we might think about consciousness. But nonetheless, there's a slightly older concept which isn't going to go away called subjectivity. It isn't going to go away because it's not premised on it being a true description of the world mm -hmm. is what you might call a definite state which consciousness can find itself in. It's not a description of consciousness. It's not an account of consciousness. It doesn't have to be scientific. Where is it located? In its 
sympathetic judge, according uh, to Kant. Uh, surely. Uh, I, I wouldn't have any problem with it. The, the only problem I have uh, with, with many of these kinds of discussions is, is when the discussion becomes metaphysical. And I, I, I don't seem to want to concede to metaphysics. Uh, if I'm dragged kicking and screaming. Splendid. The, the, the whole point of, of Kant's discussion is precisely to eradicate. Right. So, the so to, to the extent that it isn't metaphysical, then it must be physical. And to the extent that it's physical, it must be located in the stuff of this world, whether it's it's in the neurons or in the collective of neurons that makes uh, you know a theory, an opinion, a, a viewpoint. <laughs> it, it must be in the world. Let everyone recall the statement: if it's not metaphysical, it's physical. Because I'm not entirely sure that's a proposition which I kind of want to buy into. It's the one or the other. However, it's there was someone here who wanted to ask a question. We already have sort of we we already have sort of generative. Aesthetics that that exist in the world and and, and you know which is nature and and have you know, well, I don't know anyway. so aesthetics has maybe traditionally and I'm you know, I'm thinking of Heidegger in particular but it doesn't really matter um, uh, a theory of you know what do we do with these kind of generative things in the world that don't come from our being they are other beings which you sort of allude alluding to already and for for Heidegger anyway. Poetics can kind of meet that other being, and something happens when they meet. So, and I'm thinking of sort of techniques like you know, poetics, narrative, you know, these sort of more, these kind of techniques that somehow aren't exactly tied up in the same discourse of this of the self-generative that you're talking about. And I'm wondering, do those kind of techniques, are they antiquated, or can they meet the self-generative aesthetic and make other things happen? Is there any place for I things have, like I that? Have, I have no, no problem, and in fact, you know, we could have spent this and many other uh, periods of time thinking and talking about the, the poetic. Right? Who, who knows if that's entirely true? But the poetic is actually a big part of all this in, in its various incarnations and with its various methodologies and, 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 uh, um, and ways of, of making, you know, the kind of field of knowledge uh, in and of itself. Uh, the, the only, the only uh, 
shit. <laughs> Sorry again. <laughs> okay. When coming to translate it to the real world, I mean, this is all digital, fair world, like it's nice and so on. Uh, but how do you translate it to matter? How does matter capture all those qualities that we've seen here? Because at the end of the day, architecture doesn't move that much. I mean, I, we're trying I, I to I make it move. A whole series of assumptions you're making. Okay. I would say that the vast majority of the environment that we live in moves all the time, and that architecture is a very, very small part of it. Most of the world is moving all the time. It's not flat, it's not square, it's not stable. It changes all the time, and we've lived with it and in it and enjoyed it forever. I said no. architecture. I'm, I mean, I'm no, not no. arguing the world, but like, how no. can you, as an architect, that's the role of architect? I think it's an architect's uh, uh, preference, in a way, and certainly an architect's predisposition, to think that the only thing that's real is material. But tell that to your bank. You know, or, or, you know I mean, there, there are all sorts of things in the world that are quite real that are not material in a literal sense. Now, I said I don't like the metaphysical and I prefer the physical. You know, forces are physical. For, you know, I, I believe in the things that are of physics. So the digital is as real to me as a brick. I mean, it's, they're both equally present. Why would I make the brick digital? I mean, wh what would that mean? Well, I could make the brick digital by, by the means that I've just described. You know, the, the, the once you get to know the structure of matter well enough, you can make a brick that's a brick and is transparent. You can make... You know, the, 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 I, mean, I think it was at MIT, it usually is at MIT, but they've just made a form, physical material form, that can actually intersect. Like, you know, like uh, on the computer, if I have a square and another square and I overlap them, no problem. In most of the physical world, when I do that, things collide. Well, but if you align the molecules correctly, as I said, there's more space than matter. And if you align them correctly, you can get them to go one into the other, like ghosts. And that can be done. It just, it's just a matter of knowing the right thing. I mean, that seems remarkable. I mean, you know, and everyone here who's a kind of student of architecture, I think, will be duly impressed. I mean, I am. The question is, what's the significance of that? Well, is it that it happens, or is it that by happening, it shows you something else? I mean, I think it's the something else that's, that's the real question. After all, the question is clearly since, how can I put it, since the appearance of Homo sapiens, technological decisions by the species, let's say the introduction of writing, have materially altered the course of evolution. You know, I mean, uh, and therefore this state in which, as it were, it suddenly presented that Homo sapiens is having to manage its biological state. It may have to manage it with a new form of consciousness, but actually it's always already been doing it. And indeed, one of the definitions of Homo sapiens is that it started by doing it. But there, there, it can't be that everything, every manner of, of doing it is the same, has been the same since it was first done and will be forever the same. It can't be that because Homo sapiens or earlier, you know, creatures killed each other with, with you know, rocks and stones and bones and, and crude weapons, that it's qualitatively the same thing to build an atomic bomb. It isn't. You know, at some point, Sorry, the, the making know. takes takes another order of... of Engagement when, to, to when contend with. Like that, I don't see any difference at all. Well, okay. I mean, we, we don't have to agree. You know, I mean, no, it's, it's, it's possible. It's possible that we don't see it the same way. I, I certainly would say that I, I perceive the changes to be happening to be qualitatively different and to be becoming more so, not less so, over time. Uh, because the point, as I mean, how can I put it in respect to evolution? I mean, Leo Tan made a great link that once the species incorporates a kind of knowledge as a norm for kind of the whole business of the reproduction of the next generation, then as it were, you've already introduced what is called the incubable, what you're calling the allied. And therefore, you know, somewhat like a lot of arguments, what what may be being advertised as currently starting, actually when you examine it, 
Jesus will leave the lady there. Well, there, there is, there is the, the, the fabulous uh, well, battle of the ancients and the moderns, which goes back to what, the 16th or 17th century? Uh, and it, it seems to be a question of one, where one. and to others a static conception that this is, this is the best of all worlds? Do I choose to present that this is a depressive world where everything is getting worse? Or do I seek to find and argue and then try to implement, not just state, you know, that there might be a way that the world can actually be other than it is and in a way that we might find to be better, right? And if we're not foolish, we can do that. And if we are foolish, then, then we'll, we'll blow the place up. But I'm, I'm, sure nice lots, I'm sure lots of people have lots of ideas about how it can be better or how it can be worse. What I think is the question is to whether either of those questions can be linked to the question of evolution. Because I don't think evolution as a mechanism knows progression or regression in strict terms, kind of, you know, the very strength. is because it's all pointless. Oh, it's pointless, but it doesn't change anything. 
doesn't have a reason to. I'm not, I'm not saying yeah. that there's a reason no, for no, it no, to no, do so, no, but no, it makes a more concise sense. Do, do we have some kind of search piece in RAM radio? Yes. I don't. I didn't say you didn't. <laughs> I don't. You what? <laughs> you believe in... Can you put it on? Have you got it on? Has it got a red light at the bottom? Yes. I mean, uh, I would love to thank for this, you know, enlightening lecture, actually. And uh, I mean, I was wondering what, you know, this tension. I do not get where is it getting, where is it building, because. I mean, for once, uh, it was a matter of subjectivity, or how how do we, as species, uh, you know, take part of this evolution of of design, or is it, if it's subjective or not? And I still am not clear, you know, about this bit, and I would love to be clear about it. I thought you know, maybe you could. I, I think. changing the uh, composition of uh, the material molecule we could provide we could evolve a new material is it the architecture of this one not the break not the material we had in past the breaks and everything but now we are going towards a micro architecture going inside the material so that we can explore more material in future more shapes that's, that's part of it. That's part of it. Uh, I think we can we can learn and create new materials. You know, for example, your skin is doing a wonderful job of, of dealing with uh, nutrition and situation and heat control and disease control and all sorts of things. And the skin is just building in. And if we could understand how the skin does all those things, we could make building in freeze or sweat or it does whatever it needs to do to keep itself going uh, to replenish itself. It doesn't necessarily have to have a strange shape, you know, but, but it, it probably does enable shapes that we haven't had. Uh, but if we can do that to building, there, there's, a, there's that. And then there's the reciprocity of that. If we do that to building, we're also applying that idea to ourselves. And, and so then 
say that this way of protecting the world is also a way of righting the world, right? And it's, I'm impatient. And if, if that's the way it's done, and I can turn it around, I can't stop with that. I say, well, what if I change that way of thinking? And, you know, you, you take a few logical steps. You're very, you know, very clear, very, I think, very level-headed. And you arrive at places like this. Now, it could be my madness, you know, but, but I think it's not, and I think it's actually what we're, what we're engaged in. I think it's actually true to the world. And so my, my you know, if, if this is at all true to you, we'll see it tomorrow. You know, we'll, we'll go walking around the world and we'll see how it's constructed. It's like the matrix, all of a sudden you, you, you get it, right? And, and, but then you've, you've all decided in some way or another that you're either makers, literally, you know, archi architects, artists, musicians, writers, whatever you are, or you're the theorists of it and, and the sort of intellectual articulators of how it works. And consequently, it's your problem. I mean, I don't see how it isn't, unless you choose to ignore it. And, I, and I, that doesn't seem to be an option. I mean, walking backwards into the future is a sure way to fall off the cliff. Basically, by, 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 by giving up one manner of production by giving in to that one manner of production. So there's, so there's that. So when you go to these things, you give up entirely. I said that you, the distinction you make is that of a dark matter. And you wouldn't want to sit on that dark matter anymore. There, there's a so-called visual music of the elite or the bourgeoisie in China that they call the idea of the ascension of evil. Thank you. 